Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We certainly thank you for your goodness. We don't ever feel like anything great is accomplished outside of prayer. So I'm asking that today that we'll do our best to honor you and all that we do. Thank you, Lord, for being able to live in the greatest country that's ever been and probably ever will be. And Lord, I believe one of the reasons that we are great today outside of your presence and outside your blessings is our military, is our men and women who are willing to sacrifice and give their lives so that we can do what we do today. And God, help us to do our best today in all that we say and do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
We are honored to have in our church a number of our military men and women. Thank God for them. And this morning, we'd like for you to hear for just a few minutes from U.S. Army Sergeant Major Wendell Barnell. <clears throat> I stand with humble heart for all who have fallen. Memorial Day is not just another holiday. It is a special day set aside to pay tribute, honor, and thanks to our fallen heroes who sacrificed life so we can enjoy our freedom. Please remember their families. They gave a loved one for all of us. Let us be thankful to sacrifice those who have given it all. America is a God-fearing nation, proud, strong, brave, free. God provided us with vast farmland, natural resources to meet our needs, and in 246 years, we became the richest, most powerful nation on earth. Our armed forces have the task to protect and defend what God has given, even at the expense of war. Believe, we believe, and worship God who created us and gave us his only begotten son who shed his blood and died for us. He died for the world. Jesus was resurrected. He became our Lord and Savior. So trust and have faith in what God has done for you and me. America has given their sons and their daughters who shed their blood and died for all of us and became our heroes. American soldiers have served around the world to defend the right to be free. We stand for liberty and justice for all. I believe God has a special blessing in heaven for our heroes. John 15, 13. You see it on your bulletin. Greater love has no man than those who will lay down their life for his friends. We have our own this morning, Gunnery Sergeant Marty Harrell will be presenting what's known as the Fallen Comrade or the Battle Cross. <clears throat> Before he does that, I want you to pay close attention and watch carefully what he's doing, but I want to tell you what it's about. <clears throat> the Battle Cross is a sacred symbol that's used to show honor and respect to a fallen comrade. And these symbols serve as a rallying point where surviving members of a unit can mourn and remember their fallen comrades. The rifle it will be affixed with a bayonet and inverted, signifying the soldier went down fighting. The boots signifying the soldier's last march onto the battlefield. The dog tags are imprinted with the soldier's name and hung from the rifle so that the identity will never be forgotten. The helmet is placed atop the rifle, representing what the soldiers stood for and signifying that their battle is now over. And we're grateful for U.S. Marine Gunnery Sergeant Marty Harrell as he performs a fallen comrade ceremony with the Battlefield Cross.
you'll join me as we pledge allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As we pledge to the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. You'll join me in saluting the Word of God, God's Word. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Gentlemen, you can post your flags. Our Father, once again, we are so thankful and so grateful for America, for the country that we have been. Lord, I pray that we won't soon change. I, I pray, God, that once again that you would show us your favor and your grace. Lord, I pray for the leadership of our country that somewhere along the line, that their eyes would be open to you and understand and realize the only reason that we're great is because of you. And when we cease making much of you, we'll cease being great. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for the love that we have for our veterans, for those who have paid the ultimate price, for those who are still serving. Lord, for that we're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Kids, y'all can go and everybody else can be seated. Okay.
They make me look good, don't they? Y'all stand with me. Turn to 270 or just look at the screen. Sing the first and last verse. <clears throat> Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Which is Marty's wife during Sunday school? I said, uh, I said, did you marry him before or after you saw him in that uniform? And she said, I married him before, but don't he look good? You know, he could be a poster child for the Marine Corps. But uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate all of our veterans and all that they do. All righty, I know we have a number of folk that's on vacation and here, there, and yonder, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for being with us today. I wondered if we have maybe somebody snuck in and, and uh, said, I'm here for the first time. Anybody at all like that anywhere in the building with the first time visitors? All right, all home folk. Thank you guys so much. Bobby, did you see one or are you just walking out that way? I guess he's just walking out that way. Oh, well, there's one over there. Good, wonderful. We're glad to have you. Good. He put you on the spot, didn't he? <laughs> Tell you what, guys, uh, Meredith, skip on over to the next course, okay? Would you please fill my cup, Lord? I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirst. Anybody got a spiritual thirst this morning? Got a need this morning? I thought so. Most of us do in some sort of the other. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirst of my soul. Let me tell you something, guys. Ain't nobody like him. He can do things that you never thought that he can do, and he can. And he does it right on time in our hearts and lives. Y'all help me as we sing. Here we go. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up. Sometimes it takes one time to go through something before y'all catch on what we're going through, okay? We're going to try that one more time and sing it with a smile on your face and sing it as a testimony to the grace of God. Okay, here we go. 
say this. Thank you so much for wearing the red, white, and blue. Some of y'all, I feel like I needed to salute you this morning, you know. You really look nice. Okay, all right, you can be seated. trials that it seemed I faced alone wondering why God left me here to struggle on my own I thought of all the verses and the scriptures I had read how he promised to be with me how he never forsake me so with all the faith within me I cried out to God and said you were there for Moses you were there for Joseph you were there for David when he did Stephen, so I believe in time I'll see that through it all you were there for me. me. Oh, there will be days of silent suffering when it seemed that no one cared. May come and go without an answer to my prayers. Oh, but may I never question your unfailing love for me. And like the saints who've gone before me, may my faith be one more story of a life lived for your glory. So that others will believe you were there for Moses, you were there for Joseph, you were there for David when he didn't have a prayer, you were there for Stephen. So I believe in time. I guides me through this weary land. You were there for Moses. You were there for Joseph. You were there for David. When he didn't have a prayer, you were there for 
Stand with me one more time. Turn to number 186. Sing the first, second, and the fourth verse. Because I like the second verse, and I'm up here. about it to bear it on dark Calvary so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down
Y'all can be seated. Tracy, you're singing, aren't you? Yeah. We get Chuck on here in a minute. Come on here. I appreciate Chuck and Joe filling in. Beck and Terry still. I talked with Beck this week. One time I talked to him, they were in Branson, Missouri. Next time I talked to them, they were somewhere in Arkansas. I'm just glad they're not in jail somewhere. I'm just thankful. <laughs> and they'll be back uh, next Sunday. Okay. Okay, I'm singing a cappella this morning, so don't wait for any music to start. <laughs> In the harvest fields now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small? and little known it is great if god is in it and he'll not forget his own little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name, when you enter heaven's portals and the Savior's face we see, cares of life will be forgotten, we'll be happy, glad, and free. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. I challenge any of y'all to get up here and sing without music. Anybody? Anybody? Van, you ready? Oh, no, no, no. I have breakfast every morning with Van, and uh, he's known for these words. Now, I'm not trying to start anything, but I just thought I'd say he's always stirring the pot. Does he tell you about that, Miss Frankie? Oh, he's always, never mind. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the legacy of faith. Now, I, I'm sorry I forgot to tell you earlier that the, we're not having Sunday night service tonight. We do that uh, for several Sundays through the year, Mother's Day, Father's Day. And Memorial Day because we feel like people are with their families and such as that so no service tonight but we are Wednesday night okay Hebrews chapter 11 and I'm going to begin reading with verse 32 most of the time people begin reading with verse number one in Hebrews but we're going to look at things just a little bit different <laughs> Hebrews is an is a it's an exciting book it's I taught through the book of Hebrews one time many years ago, and it's probably one of the greatest challenges I ever had trying to go through it. But uh, <clears throat> let, let me say this about Hebrews, because oftentimes people don't know a little bit about the background. You have to understand that Hebrew was probably written to the second generation of believers uh, when, when the church first started, when Christianity first started. These 
this second generation of Christians that were living in Jerusalem and Palestine in that area, uh, persecution had started on the church. It was really getting hard and difficult. Uh, Nero was, was, was on the scene. Nero was doing everything he could to destroy Christianity and such as that. And uh, these Christians that the writer of Hebrews was writing to had become discouraged because of all that they were going through and all that they were facing, the persecution and such as that. So it, it was kind of like this. Here is a new believer, a second generation believer. He's standing here and he's watching his friends and loved ones, maybe his cousins and brothers and sisters, and they're all walking to temple. They're going, they're still Jewish in their belief and they're going to temple and here he is, a believer in the Messiah. And because he is a believer in Jesus, because he is a, a believer in Christ as the Messiah, he's going through all kind of persecution. He's losing his house. He's losing everything that he has because of his faith in Christ. So there were some of the Hebrews, meaning Jewish believers, some of the Hebrew believers were getting so discouraged, they were about to go back into their Jewish belief. So the writer of Hebrews is writing them to try to encourage them to stay with it, stick with it, okay? And some of those that I'm going to read about in these verses this morning are some believers that uh, pay the ultimate price, just like many of our military men and women have paid the ultimate price in order for you and I to have the freedom that we have today. Uh, that's the only reason that we get to do what we get to do today, because of them. Same thing, what I want you to do this morning is I want you to think spiritual, okay, uh, about the, the price that was paid for you and I to be able to do what we do today. And just follow along with me, you'll better understand it. Verse 30 through 32, Hebrews 11. And what shall I more say, for the time would fail me of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Japheth, of David, also and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire... There he's talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's, he's referring back to the Old Testament believers. He talks about the escape, the edge of the sword. He's talking about Elijah and Elisha there in reference. Uh, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in, the, in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Talking about Gideon and Samson. Look at verse 35, kind of a strange verse. Women received their dead raised to life again. You say, preacher, who in the world is he talking about there? I think he has reference to the widows of Zarephath and the, the woman at Shunem in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, how they, their, dead, their dead ones were raised from dead, though they died again, but they were raised. He goes on to say in, in verse 30, uh, 35, And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed asunder. That sawed asunder has a reference back to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was ordered to be sawed asunder by the king of Israel, Manassas. Now, that's how far the Jews and the Israelites had got away from God. Now, listen carefully. That's the direction that America is headed. How far America is getting away from God. Even the king, Manassas, ordered the prophet, the preacher of God, to be sawed asunder. Unbelievable. And they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Verse 40. God, having provided some better thing for us, 
that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, I'm going to read the first three verses of chapter 12. The first three verses of chapter 12 is basically this. It is talking about the characters of chapter 11 and how they are examples or illustrations for you and I to continue on, to keep on at it. No matter what we may go through in life, God, by our faith, God will raise us up. God will protect us. There's nothing that you and I face in life that God's not better than and stronger than. Okay. But anyhow, look at verse 12. Wherefore, referring back to what's just been said, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, they are the, they are the examples that we can follow. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Now, you say, what do you think the sin is there? I think the sin is referring to the lack of faith. That's just my personal opinion. The sin which does so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endures such contradictions of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds father lord i pray that you'd enable me to make an application to where we could understand some things about memorial day and our our, our men and women of the military but we can also understand the price that's required of we as Christians. That someday in our lives we may be required to take a stand and it costs us something. I pray not our lives, but we don't know. But God, I think you've called all of us to stand for you. It's not popular, it's not easy, but it's right. And I ask, Lord, that you'd help me this morning to make this thing plain. In Christ's name, amen and amen. You know, to me personally, and I'm just trying to put a personal twist on this this morning, holidays are such a part of being an American. It's just, that's the way I always perceive it. They're about, if you study a little bit, there are about 10 or 12 holidays that we celebrate in America. Uh, for the most people, though not all, because family and circumstances, holidays, most of the time are about family, they're about food, they're about fellowship, and they're about fun. And I think that's the way it ought to be. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I look forward to holidays. I look forward to being with family. I look forward to uh, <laughs> being able to eat things without sense of guilt. You know, just sit down with a container of ice cream and just go at it. And not, ain't that preaching? And not feel guilty about that one iota. Why? Because it's holiday. You ought to be able to do whatever you want to do on a holiday. You ought to be able to ride a motorcycle on a holiday, bless God, you know, without your wife looking that cross-eyed at you, you know, like you're a fool. But anyhow, uh, and, you know, and I'm sure that not everybody knows the meaning of the story behind all holidays. I, I, I get that. We, 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 we got Christmas down pat, you know. We, we know it's about the birth of Christ. We pretty well understand Easter, uh, about the resurrection and, and that. Uh, some people, I think, still struggle a little bit with Thanksgiving Day. You know, Thanksgiving Day, it didn't have its beginning with most of us eating more chicken and dressing and turkey and dressing and watching a football game. That's not really where Thanksgiving began. I know some of y'all may think that, but that's not really true. Actually, uh, Thanksgiving dates back to 1621. Uh, the year after the Puritans arrived in Massachusetts and they had determined to practice their freedom of religion. Did you ever realize that? That one of the reasons that America became America and one of the reasons that they left the mother country to come to this new country was that they would have the freedom of religion that they have today. And uh, uh, after a rough winter when they first landed, after a rough winter in which about half of them died, they turned to help to the neighboring Indians that were living there where they landed. 
And then that following fall, there was a, a bountiful harvest, and the Puritans invited the Indians, and that was the first Thanksgiving that took place in America. The 4th of July, or Independence Day, this honors the nation's birthday. It was founded on July the 4th in 1776. If I'm not mistaken, Wendell helped me this morning. We're 246 years old uh, as, a, as a nation. We will we'll be this year. And I don't have time to deal with all the holidays, nor is this message about all the other holidays. But I do want you, before you leave here this morning, I, I want you to understand what tomorrow's about. I want you to understand about Memorial Day. I want to give you, first of all, what I'd like to do is give you uh, a, just a, a little bit of a background about Memorial Day, and then I'm going to try to make an application spiritually where this applies to your life and my life today. Our present, now this is really an interesting story, so I hope that you'll stay with me on this. Our present commemoration of this day came out of the Civil War. It was in 1865, shortly after the close of the war, some women in Vicksburg, Mississippi, chose May the 30th as the day to place flowers upon the graves of those who had died in battle. Now, this practice of choosing a special day to decorate the graves of the war dead soon spread both north and south, and it came to be called Decoration Day. Three years later, in 1868, there was a group of women in Washington, D.C. They asked permission of the War Department to decorate the graves at Arlington National Cemetery and to be allowed to have a special memorial service to mark that particular occasion. And after a lot of discussion, permission was granted, but the, now listen carefully, but the officials attached a harsh provision, and this was the provision that they attached to it. No flowers were to be placed on the graves of the Confederate soldiers who were buried in a separate section of the cemetery. And the ladies finally agreed and planned their program. <clears throat> General James Garfield, a devout Christian who later became president of the United States, he delivered the memorial speech, and in accordance with their agreement, flowers were placed only upon the graves of the Union dead, the northern soldiers, and not upon the graves of the Confederate section. Now listen carefully. I thought this was pretty good. But after the crowds were gone, a strong wind arose and blew almost all of the flowers onto the Confederate graves. And when that became known, many of the people believed that it was a direct result of God's intervention. And after that, the order to ignore the Confederate graves was never repeated. Now it's called Memorial Day, and it's observed as a day to honor the fallen of our nation's wars and a time when our country pauses long enough to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we enjoy today. And we owe them and those who serve with them far more than we ever could pay for what they've done for us. But anyhow, as I was putting this particular message together, I, I thought about the families who may have served in the military, or, you know, um, we've got a little saying around here, <clears throat> is nothing is really important until it's personal. And I thought about that, and, and I thought of the, the, the men, or mostly the women, who had loved ones that went off and served somewhere, and they, they had to wait and pray that they got back. Nothing ever becomes real important until it hits home, does it? until it's your son or your daughter or your mom or your dad or, or whatever it may be. Our military men and women are willing to sacrifice whatever may be asked of them so that we can do what we're doing today. But I, I thought about one other thing. All our military men and women didn't die, but all of our men and women of the military were willing to. I believe that with all of my heart. Not all of them died, but those that put on the uniform of America were willing to give their lives 
uh, in, in service of our country. And whatever, you know, we, every Memorial Day is what the writer of Hebrews is saying in principle. That's what, what the writer is talking about in chapter number 11. Hebrews 11 is often referred to as the heroes of faith. And these men and women referred to in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, talking about their faith in God, they made a difference in the lives of other people. Uh, chapter 12, as you go into it, is saying, remember those who changed their world and go and do likewise, is basically what it's saying. And time, you know, won't permit us to consider all of these heroes of the faith. But one weapon they all had in common, every single one of them, that one weapon that each had was absolute faith in God. And what I want to try to convey to you this morning is simply this, and I hope you'll listen carefully, is you're not going to make a difference in the lives of others. You're not going to make a difference in the lives of your sons and daughters, your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wife, whatever it may be, outside of faith. God uses faith in our lives to impact and change the lives of other people, plain and simple. So let's consider faith on the thought of Memorial Day and try to make an application to where we are today. I'm going to give you three points. Number one, their faith, I'm talking about theirs in, in Hebrews chapter number 11, their faith in the miraculous intervention of God in the affairs of man. That's number one. What I mean by that is simply this. You know, we always seem to equate faith with something tangible. Uh, you know, we've always got faith in something that we can touch, something that we can say, I, I, I trust that chair. I believe that chair will hold me up or that seat that you're sitting in is going to hold me up. That's, that's a tangible faith. You know, but... Uh, Sometimes God will call us to trust him with what I would call blind faith. For instance, God will ask us to trust. You, you know the miracles that Jesus did in, in, the, in, the, in the Bible. Of course, Old Testament miracles too. But some of the miracles that Jesus did, Christ made the blind to see. That blind person had to have faith to trust God. He couldn't see him, but he trusted God. He made the deaf to hear. He made the lame to walk. Uh, he raised the dead and such as that. That was all by faith. And if you and I are going to do anything great for God, we've got to learn to do it by faith. You've got to learn to trust God and to believe God's going to do and believe God's going to honor this book. If you and I, what we do in our lives will line up with what he says in this book, God says, I'll honor you and we'll do what I say. But our problem, folk, is that we're not willing to line up our faith with what God said he wants to do. Have you ever considered the, the miracle of faith in a circumstance to where God would have to show up? Let me give you a couple of illustrations, some that I, I read this week. There was a blind girl one day who was caught in a fire, and she was on the 10th floor of a, of a high-rise building. She made her way to the window of the building, but she couldn't see anything. She was blind. Now, keep that in mind. She felt the heat. She smelled the smoke of the fire. Then she heard the firemen down, 10 stories down, yell, jump, jump. They had this thing down there that could, that could catch her. She said, I'm scared to jump. I, I, I can't see. The firemen said, if you don't jump, you're going to die. Take the risk and jump. I want you to think with me for just a minute. It's bad enough to jump from 10 stories high, but to jump when you can't see where you're jumping, that's terror. But in the midst of all the chaos that was going on and in the midst of all the confusion that was going on, she heard one voice that she picked up on. She heard a voice say this, Darling, you go ahead and jump. I got you. She smiled real big. She said, okay, Daddy, I hear you. And Jesus Christ is inviting you and I to jump. He knows we're nervous, but just jump. He knows you're scared, just jump. Remember, we're talking about your daddy. We're talking about somebody you know. You, you, you know you've seen him. 
you can trust him in what he says. I read this other little story that went along with this. Oftentimes, this is what our faith looks like. A man slid over the side of a cliff, and he was just barely able to grab a hold of a branch just before this last, last second he grabbed a hold of this branch. He hung dairling over, over a, high, it was a high cliff, hundreds of feet high, in the ground below. And he screamed out with a loud voice, help me, somebody help me. And a voice came out of the sky, do you believe I can help you? The, the man responded, yes, I believe, please help me. The voice came out of the sky again, do you believe? that I have the power to help you. Yes, I believe, I believe. Please, please help me. Do you believe I love you enough to help you? Yes, I know you love me. Please, oh, please help me. Because you believe, then I will help you. Now let go. And after a brief silence, the man said again, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> Sometimes that's kind of the way our faith is, is it not, folk? Is there anybody else that can help us in our life? I want to show you, look if you would at chapter 11, verse number 7. Look at a couple of characters in our, in our text that I think that will make a difference as you consider their life. He says, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. You know, I, I, I have a lot of folk that I look forward to when I get the glory to meet and, and talk about things. And Noah is, is one of the, at the top of the list. Noah believed God that God was going to do something that had never happened before. And because of Noah's faith, his family, the Bible says his family was saved. You know, I thought about that. Let me ask you a question. Won't you listen to me? Now, this is not real popular, or it won't be real popular with you. Will your faith impact your family and others? I want you to think with me for just a minute. Just, just use your mind's eye for a second. And do you think about your child, your children, your, maybe your grandchildren, Maybe even your great-grandchildren, whatever it may be. Will your faith impact them enough to make a difference in their eternity? Can they see your faith and the faith demonstrated in your life? Look again at our text if you'll notice in chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham. You now, we looked at Noah's faith. Look what he said about Abraham. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. He didn't have a clue where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in a tabernacle with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I want you to think with me for just a second. He went on to say, Therefore, sprang there even of the ones of him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and a multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. In other words, he had so many kids later on. He had so many that was connected with him because of the faith that he chose to take in his life. Abraham was asked by God to go to a place that he didn't know anything about. <laughs> My wife and I were coming back yesterday from uh, Tennessee. We took uh, her brother, Brad, up to spend a week or so with uh, his brother, who's a truck driver. And Brad loves going up there and going out on the truck and such as that. So uh, we were on our way back and... Uh, uh, I've always got a better idea of how to get back. I've always got a better idea of the, of the route that we need to take, but I thought this time I'm going to listen to my wife. <laughs> she, 
she had the GPS, did you not? We got to a fork in the road, and it said uh, Georgia 20, which, would, would, which was the road I was wanting to take. Then it said uh, 140, 140. I'd never been on 140. She said, 140 looks good. I said, okay, being you're in charge, 140 it is. It's amazing that we made it to Sunday school today. <laughs> we went through Alpharetta. We went through Johns Creek. We saw everybody but the governor of Georgia. <laughs> but we followed the GPS, didn't we? We, we went where that stupid GPS said. Uh, Abraham didn't have a GPS. You know, the only th you know what Abraham had? God. You know the only thing we need? God. Thank you so much. You know. But, you know, uh, I want you to do me a favor real quick. I want you to go back to the book of Romans. Let me show you what Abraham found in God. This is, uh, this is good stuff. Romans chapter number 4. This is what Abraham found. Abraham never wavered in believing all the promises of God, ever. And this is so important you get this. Romans chapter 4, look if you would at verse 20. Follow with me. Now, Abraham, when God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave. I want you to leave the Ur of Chaldees, and I'm going to show you where to go. And, and Abraham stepped out. He says in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, he, meaning Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. In other words, he believed, he didn't stagger, he didn't hesitate, he just, just went on, just like I did what she told me. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What God had promised, he was also able to perform. Right? Now, verse 22. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. What was imputed is faith. In other words, now, the word imputed, it's a banking term. It means to apply to one's account. Okay? Okay. Abraham's faith to believe what God says was applied to his spiritual account. Abraham says, God, I believe you. I'm going to trust you. I don't have a GPS. I don't agree with a GPS. I don't care what that woman says. God, I'm going to listen to you. And God listened. Uh, Abraham listened to what God said. And the Bible says it was imputed. Applied to his account. What was his faith? But read on. Okay. Uh, verse 22. Romans 4. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. What was his faith? Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone. That it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, what's that mean, preacher? That simply means this. If you will take God by faith, take him at his word, God says, I will take all of the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ, and I will impute it, I will apply it to your account. I'll take everything, just like when you get paid on Friday or whenever you get paid, they take your paycheck and they apply it to your account. All of the, all that righteousness of Jesus Christ was applied to Abraham's account. Why? By faith. You want to get saved? You do it by faith. You don't do it by joining the church. You don't do it by being a Baptist. You don't do it by all the things that you, you do it by faith. That's exactly what took place in Abraham's life. And as believers, we, we say we believe God, but does that action and living back up? 
how we live our lives. Oh, I love God, but I live like hell. Oh, I trust God, but, but I'm going to do my thing. Let me ask you this. Let's put it this way. Do you have enough faith to build a marriage and a home based on God's word? Do you, let me say that again. Do you have enough faith to build a marriage and your family and your, your raise your children based on the truth of God's word? Do you, have, do you have enough faith to trust God with your eternal soul? Do you have enough faith to trust God with your finances? Do you have enough faith to trust God and, and, and believe him to give, you, to give him priority in your life? We say we have faith. But we have convenient faith. When it's convenient, that's when I'll do it. God says, trust me at all times. Noah, watch this. Noah, by faith, built the ark for God. Abraham, by faith, walked for God. Not only have faith in the miracle invention, intervention of God. Let me give you the second thing real quick. A faith that honors God even in the face of of great obstacles. Again, in our text, if you look at chapter 11, begin with verse 23. Go back just a little bit. We're looking at Moses for a second. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. That means favored child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured as seeing him who was invisible. In other words, everything that, that Moses did, Moses did by faith. Moses says, I'll give up all that Egypt's got to offer by faith. I believe the word of God. I believe what God says in his word, and I'm going to trust him by faith. You know, it's amazing nowadays how people talk about that they've got faith and trust God until the rubber hits the road. It was, it was their faith in God that gave the, you know, the, the courage to go against Pharaoh's command and, and hide their child as far as Moses' his parents was concerned. And then in verses 24 and 25, I'm not going to take time to read it, Moses had enough faith to identify himself with God's people. I think that's a lesson that we all could learn. How many of God's people choose the world's way and not God's way? Oh, I'd rather be like the world. I'd rather play footsie with the world than to do the things God's way. Let me tell you something, guys. There's going to be times in your life as a Christian, God's going to put you in a situation on purpose to see what your face made of. I guarantee you. He's going to see if you're going to, are you going to trust me? Or are you going to believe me? You know, a, a faith that's not worth testing is not worth having. And God knows that in our hearts and in our lives. The Bible says that, and I listen carefully what I'm getting ready to say. Sometimes I say things that's worth writing down. Not often, but this is one of them, okay? Listen carefully. He, and I'm talking about Moses. He feared Pharaoh so little because he feared God so much. Ain't that good? And I don't think I read that anywhere. I think I've come up with that. But I'm not sure. He feared Pharaoh. Let's talk about Moses. He feared Pharaoh so little because he feared God so much. You know, uh, that's what faith really is, is being able to see the invisible. Here's a question. When was the last time you demonstrated faith in the face of great obstacles? You know, the entire nation of Israel was impacted as a result of the faith of one man, Moses. Who sees your faith in face of obstacles and is compelled to believe God because of how you respond to the obstacles in your life? You, you see, guys, 
God will put you in a circumstance or in a position or a situation to where people will watch how you respond in that situation to see if the faith that you say you have is genuine or not. And if it's not genuine, they don't have nothing to do with your faith. I, you know, just not real deep. They just don't have nothing to do with it. Who sees your faith during those times? How your faith impacts your family or your friends and those you work with or whatever the circumstance may be. Do they see your faith in action? Or is your faith just like the world's faith? I think that's why Paul said what he did in, in Romans 12 too. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why would that be so important so that they could see your faith? Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You know, Satan will whisper in your ear, well, live that way and, and people's going to laugh at you. God says, live by faith and trust me and I'll put a smile on your face. And that's all I care about. If God will put a smile on my face, I don't care what you think. I really don't. You say, well, preacher, you, you want your church to like it? Sure I do. I need all the friends I can get. But I want him, I want to put a smile on his face more than anything else in the world. So, what we've learned about faith. Number one, we have seen the miracles, the miraculous intervention of God in the affairs of men. That's certainly seen in Noah and Abraham. Secondly, a faith that honors God even in the face of great obstacles. That's seen in the life of Moses. Lastly, I'll give you this last point. A faith that holds believers steady in the face of hostile circumstances. If you look at your text again in Hebrews 11, verse 35, I can't imagine, you know, we read these verses so quick, but I can't imagine what these women and these folk went through. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, they stuck by the stuff. Others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, or bond and imprisonment. That was Jeremiah. They were stoned. They were sold asunder. You know, all that Isaiah had to say to Manassas was, I don't believe. No. Put that saw up. I don't believe. What Isaiah said, help yourself, big boy. All I'm going to do is go to glory. Saul asunder, were tempted, were slain with a the sword. They wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. We got people nowadays that gripe and complain because it's too cold in here. Don't raise your hand, Mary. That don't help. <laughs> gripe and complain. Feel uncomfortable. I just stay at home. You know what I think about that? Help yourself. But preacher, you got to have people. I have to have God. You preach too long. I know. You're too loud. I know. I'd rather have music that moves me. I can give you stuff that will move you. I'm not going to go there. I, start. <laughs> I better leave that alone. I? Okay. The ultimate sacrifice was paid by the one who owed no debt. That's what chapter 12 is all about. I want you to look again, and I'm, I'm through. Look what he says in verse number 1, chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. God's put each and every one of us in a race. All of us have different obstacles that we face in this race that we go through. I don't know what yours may be. You know, some of y'all are asked to 
deal with more obstacles than others. Now, I understand that. I couldn't deal with some of the things that some of y'all have to deal with. We have ladies that come to our church that are married to jerks. You said, preacher, that's not nice. Well, they ought not to be a jerk. We have, uh, you know, we have others that, that have to go through all kind of difficulties just to, just to try to love God and serve God. We have people that, that others that say, well, all y'all churches, all y'all about is money. How much do you hear me talk about money? This ain't my work. This is God's work. And if he wanted to shut it down tomorrow, shut her down. This is his. Giving is between you and him, not me and you. I close, if you look at verse 1 again, the sin, let, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. I, I believe it means the sin of unbelief or lack of faith. But, but what are we to do, preacher? Look at verse 2 and we'll pray. Looking unto Jesus, the author, word author means captain, and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I was talking in my Sunday school class this morning of all that Jesus went through and all the things he had to deal with for me and for you. The scourging. But the thing, I'll close. The thing that, that got to me, it was in my devotions this week, is I read how Jesus, when he was first arrested by the Roman soldiers, was taken to the high priest's the religious potentate, the religious leader, taken to his house. And it was in the religious leader's house that they first started hitting Jesus in the face and spitting on him. Not, not, the, the, not the, so much the enemy. Not, you'd expect that from Romans. But these were Jewish leaders. These were, these were, as I told my class, it would be like Terry bringing uh, Lawrence to the preacher's office. And if Lawrence didn't say what I wanted him to say, Terry just hauled off and knocked the snot out of it. You need to say what we want you to hear. It's a whole, a whole lot like the politics today in Washington, D.C. If you don't agree with us, you're an idiot. Same, same principle, same thing. You said, preacher, I don't like it. I don't care. Listen, I, I am so weary of, of all that's going on in our political system, in our media, and how hypocritical they are. It just, uh, it's a sight. But anyhow, this is not a political message. Faith is what's going to make a difference in your life, in my life. Are we going to trust him? Are we going to believe him? Am I going to live out my faith? Why is that so important, preacher? So that your loved ones can see Jesus in you. That's the whole thing. That, you know, God says, I'll give you what you need to point others to me, but you've got to trust me. You've got to trust me. Father, help us to trust you. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to see you high and lifted up where you deserve. Help us, Lord, to desire to bring others to you. Help us to see our children and our grandchildren and our friends, those that we've known for years. Help us to have a heart for them to see Jesus Christ in the life that we live. And that may cost us something, not monetarily. But it may cost us something. But Lord, give us a heart to be willing to pay, to sacrifice, to do whatever. Lord, if we're going to believe this book, we've got to believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine.
So, Lord, help us to be willing to die to self and put you on the throne of our lives. Not be ashamed of the gospel, not for one second. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. All right, let's.